uh, solicitor and, and, and so on. On the other side, you have the potential payment application where the device can, can be a barrier or not, a second, uh, depending on, on uh, the processing power and the characteristics of the... Do you think there is sufficient business case and market to justify the investment? Is uptake uh, such to, 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 to attract further investment? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, it's, a v it's perhaps the best uh, use case. For example, you talk about a land registry, right? Uh, in certain markets, uh, there isn't a proper land registry system. So there's nothing very complete on paper. There's nothing very complete on database. So in fact, we realize that these are the markets that are uh, very readily uh, adopting blockchain. Uh, in fact, uh, that's, a, that's a saying in the blockchain industry. For people in the developed market, uh, getting a Bitcoin is a form of investment. You want to get 10 times return from your investment from Bitcoin. So I think uh, that is very good, but there are markets that people use Bitcoin as a hedge of um, currency devaluation. I think that is like the, the best market to go into for blockchain and also cryptocurrency because it's a way for survival or, or a way for improvement. So I think, uh, for example, for what you say, a land registry in developing market, I think that is a very good way for blockchain to uh, flourish. Mm -hmm. It was actually, um, um, it's, it's just reminding me because I think it's a really fantastic point, especially when we talk about uh, global development and business development and how people see themselves within the global economy. There was a very interesting case study on Honduras where they actually did have cases of government taking away lands from people illegally because in the end if you don't have any trail of paperwork and you are under some sort of a dictatorship uh, government that we unfortunately often see happening in the emerging markets people can come up and say I'm sorry but this land actually belongs to the brother of or to the part of the government etc and you have no way of proving the identity and your family belonging to this uh, to this land on the other side, I think it would be also interesting to mention the projects that uh, Microsoft was engaging in recently about the development of the digital ID of people as well as things within the blockchain system. Because having a digital ID means that you don't need to have any physical paperwork. Of course, at some point we have to think about um, the ethics of it and how much information we want to give into the system, into the open blockchain that is actually decentralized system, so it's not managed by anyone in particular. But at the same point, if we take an example of a uh, recent immigration crisis that we had in Europe, if we just think for a second, if all of these people actually did have their IDs and entities within a system, it would make a lot of the organizations and a lot of the borders management much easier. Uh, we got a technology that is 10 years old, just over 10 years old, uh, at least in the current interpretation of, uh, of blockchain and distributed ledgers. You know, 10 years are a very long time. In 10 years, we have seen other technologies developing and getting bigger market adoption. What do you think is uh, uh, hindering uh, the development of, uh, of blockchain in the industry? Is it developing as fast as it could? Could it be better? What, what is in between the concept and widespread adoption? I think I should let's start. Okay. Zach on um, yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, even though it's 10 years, um, the main um, attraction to blockchain only really started uh, 24 months ago. And the simple reason is because of the price of Bitcoin. So um, I think um, it took a while for people to really get to know Bitcoin. And uh, for the right or for the wrong reasons, uh, we all know what Bitcoin is. So I think for um, the past 24 months, it's like very crazy development for, I guess, your company, our company, because of how blockchain and the price of Bitcoin has fluctuated. So there's so much changes in the market. And I think the, the question right now is that uh, what companies or which uh, country is actually doing real uh, blockchain implementation? So I think it's a big challenge uh, right now because um, there are many uh, players that are not really uh, doing enough 
Um, so I think for our company, we hope that we can change that. Uh, we hope that we can play a small part, starting from a pure fintech, um, really delivering um, uh, solutions, and then moving into blockchain. And interestingly, we started in uh, the developing market, but what we did was actually um, fairly interesting enough for the developed market, in fact, the whole world uh, to pick it up. So um, our solution, which is a blockchain point of sales and also a blockchain mobile phone, uh, is actually being delivered uh, all over the world. So I think uh, really getting the real product out and really getting a real use case is the key for blockchain to, to, to flourish, to, to move forward. Thank yeah. you. Aliona, uh, seven, about six, seven years ago, I remember publishing, publishing a report and doing a res research on the application of, of blockchain. And while the technology was recognized to have potential out of its own features, like the, the security, the ability to decentralize the, the control of, the, of an immutable and tamper-proof database and so on, one of the challenges that we had in those days were the connectivity between the legacy systems that are operating on a very different logic and the distributed ledger application where the point of contact mm -hmm. was somehow a problem to become um, an issue, a, a barrier to adoption. Uh, you work in an environment that is touching a lot of legacy systems. Yes. Has that barrier been overcome? Is it solved or you still see um, system compatibility and touch point issues? Actually, I think it's a fantastic question and I thank you very much for it because uh, even aside of uh, talking ab about new technology as blockchain, generally in logistics and international trade, the policies, laws and regulations is a very sensitive subject. When we're talking about blockchain implementation in logistics, um, I would agree with Zach on this point actually. It's very important to see the exact case studies of it functioning because currently there are different projects that are being developed by some of the bigger players like Maersk, uh, pairing with uh, IBM to develop the cargo tracking system. We also have a few projects initiated by Hyundai with the Samsung blockchain, other carriers, etc. But there is no real blockchain implementation on a big scale so that people would actually see that it's a real case for logistics. And on top of that, we could apply the policies and the systems, which I believe should be managed by the International Chamber of Commerce of Hong Kong, most likely, to have a unified uh, regulations for the whole system. In general, for the shipping and logistics, having any type of integrated protocol for technology and policy that would regulate it in an efficient way is a very difficult challenge. I think we are going to see results and solutions, but maybe not as soon as we would like to. Is it a lack of standards? Is it a regulation barrier? I think it's a little bit of regulations barrier because uh, another thing that you have to remember, um, shipping industry is one of the most conservative industries in the world. We are dealing with some of the very big players and not all of them are prepared to disclose their data, enter the transparency and decentralize their database. So on top of this challenge, I believe that major companies, of course, would have a lot of influence on the policies and regulations that are implemented in this place. So I think until the bigger players are convinced that blockchain is a real solution and a real technology that will boost and actually benefit all of the players involved, I think that will be difficult to have any policy in place. What is your take? I mean, you're in payments, so payments is a regulatory intense yeah. type of environment. What is your experience? Yeah, I actually uh, agree with Aliona, which is uh, it's very hard to break down uh, the existing structure. I mean, the richer they are, the stronger they are, it's, it's very hard to break down. So uh, for us that are in the payment, it's also uh, not easy to uh, get the banks to come on board. So maybe a way for us to do is to look at markets that doesn't have uh, existing uh, solutions. So um, one of the key markets that we are in is Indonesia, which is uh, quite underbanked. So I think uh, the uptake is actually pretty uh, good there. Um, another market that we have pretty good traction recently is actually uh, Venezuela uh, because of the um, currency uh, fluctuation. So a lot of people acquire Bitcoin because they want a stability in their salary. So I think um, that there are two ways to it. Um, you know, working with 
uh, the advanced market, the advanced players, I think that, uh, that is very good. Uh, we should definitely continue doing that. And at the same time, I think there are uh, markets that might be able to sort of like, um, there's no legacy issues, right? I mean, they're, they're not uh, leaving anything out because uh, maybe there isn't anything to start with. So I think that that is uh, maybe how blockchain can develop faster than, than it is right now. So practically, we have a parallel to what has been in PESA for mobile money and Kenya That's right. addressing a space, a void in the market where dealing with uh, established incumbent industries with large players uh, can somehow slow down the adoption for a number of different, uh, different reasons. But like, if we look at what's going on right now out there, like there's a KYC uh, pilot and investment uh, uh, by Goldman Sachs. There's, uh, there's one done by IBM, a proof of concept with Deutsche, HSBC, Mitsubishi uh, on, on KYC. I mean, KYC alone, Goldman Sachs um, calculated that the, the cost of KYC right now to, to the industry is anything between three to five billion per year of paper dependent processes that go around and get duplicated over and over within companies, within units, and, and so on. That, that is a massive business case in its own right if that, place ca that, that cost can be displaced out of more efficient solution. But is it a big player, a big, big size of the pie type of game, or a market hunger driven adoption with a, with a faster fintech in between? Is there a balance? Is there a way of collaborating in between? There's uh, a point of junction? I think for a fintech startup, uh, it's, it's always a question. Do we want to move like really, really fast? Or do we want to be more compliant? Because being compliant slows you down. So uh, I think uh, blockchain actually offers um, a very interesting solution. Because um, maybe you can be even more compliant on blockchain. Because you are doing something very different from the bank. You can be uh, verified on the blockchain, your identity can be truth, um, no one can change it, and I think that is also a very interesting uh, for people that are doing a KYC or AML solution. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious challenge for blockchain companies um, to do KYC and AML, but blockchain solution might be the answer for uh, KYC uh, and AML, yeah. Thank you. Um, any questions from the audience? Uh, if, you, if you have any questions for the panel, just please lift your hand and, and we will be very happy to, uh, to, to broaden up the discussion. So can we have a microphone, please? Oh. Do you think when this technology, blockchain technology, will become uh, widely adopted by massive customers or consumers, is it something they're going to be aware of and they're going to be asking companies to do? Or is it something that is going to be uh, happening behind the curtains and like customers won't be so aware of it? Thank you. Um, I actually think that most of the businesses and technologies are done by people for people. So independently of the end customer actually using the blockchain themselves, I think they will have a lot of benefits from the company applying it. On the other side, one thing that I think we definitely should be careful with when we uh, implement blockchain and when we implement it within the company, when we not on the stage of outside sales for the end customer B2C, but actually on the stage of the inside sales when the company wants to use it, is of course training and human resources. Because currently we need to find good professionals that will know how to adopt this technology for the benefit of each sector. Even at our panel, we are representing uh, different sectors, the fintech, banking, shipping. And there are so many different things that you have to keep in mind when you want to apply a decentralized um, technology for data management. And I think the most important thing that we will keep in mind, of course, is for people understanding what it is and for people knowing what are the benefits behind it. So they're more motivated to learn and actually implement it in their daily work and daily life. Your Thank take? You. I think, I mean, if for blockchain to be really mainstream, people wouldn't be talking about blockchain. It's like um, for your database, you don't tell your client, I'm using my SQL or DB2, right? So I think when blockchain 
really becomes mainstream, um, people wouldn't ask you, hey, are you implementing blockchain? Uh, that's my take. OK. So if we go back thinking to the four years from now, what do you think it should be happening, or what is going to have the greatest influence uh, to take us uh, to a massive amount of growth to the point that when we are here again in four years' time, we are not going to talk about blockchain as we don't talk about databases, but we're going to be talking about something else. So, Zach, you go first. Um, I think uh, for every industry, maybe even for freight industry, logistic or banking, uh, every company wants to do it. So they are just waiting, right? I mean, like for example, for banking, all the major banks want to do it, um, but they don't want to be the first one to do it. So everyone is waiting. Uh, it's the same for government. Uh, because we, we get to talk to, uh, we're lucky enough to talk to a lot of governments. Um, like a lot of government wants to do it. Say Dubai wants to be the first. Uh, Singapore is very open. So I think um, now everyone is still waiting. But when the first person hops through um, the window, I think everyone would, would want to not lose out. So I think every industry is waiting for the first guy to jump in, and then, then it will be a flurry of like not wanting to miss out. So I think um, the government level is, is very, very critical. And we already see a certain government that wants to implement a citywide or a countrywide uh, blockchain solution. Um, recently, we talked to a government. Uh, 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 the country is not very big. It's actually pretty small. And the country wants to really put the whole credit bureau system uh, onto the blockchain, which means that everyone's credit history will be on the blockchain. So I think this is like a major shift. And when that happens, other countries will want to, wouldn't want to miss out. I, I think that is the, the key sort of like uh, turning point. Yeah. Thank you. I would You're agree good. on many points. Um, I would also like to follow up with some facts from the shipping. The company that I mentioned before, Maersk, is actually one of the biggest shipping lines in the shipping industry. It's a very, very influential company. So what they started about two years ago is actually some uh, trial projects with the IBM, as I mentioned. And actually, some of the recent news is that um, they already got agreement with uh, Singapore Maritime Port and uh, with one of the um, ports in Netherlands, if I'm not mistaken, it's Hog Port, to use the same database and to use the same technology so that they can actually run tests and see if it works and if it runs and if it benefits the system. I think once we step from the first cases of use and once we have the big players involved in it and actually implementing the system and the ecosystem around it and all the smaller players and emerging countries, emerging markets, newer companies will have to adapt into the system. Hopefully, um, since we see in uh, internet development so fast, and we would probably imagine that blockchain development right now is, its, is in its infancy, like internet 20 years ago, if it develops fast enough, maybe four years from now, we will be talking about ecosystem in general and how new companies and new players are finding new ways of using blockchain within the system that already exists. Thank you. We have a question. You guys are talking about um what it takes to kick off blockchain, so to speak. And uh, let's imagine that shipping lines have decided to switch onto blockchain. Let's imagine they forced their shippers and clients somehow to accept it. Let's imagine banks have decided, or the first bank decided the other, was other one as well. Um, my question is, does blockchain have to, has to erase everything and replace it? Or can it coexist with existing infrastructure? If it coexists, will banks and shipping lines and whoever need to run two systems at the same time, paying double? What's your take on this? Very interesting. So who wants to go first? I'll go first, if you don't mind. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I think at this point, it's very important to remember that blockchain can be different. Blockchain can be a private system. It can be a public system, which means it can be open to everybody and everybody can see each block's data and development update, etc. At the same time, there is some sort of blockchain that is called uh, consortium blockchain, where you, have, where you can have um, a few companies involved that has access to the information, but it's not completely openly 
um, accessible to everyone. So I think personally that definitely there will be coexisting between the systems, especially in maritime industry where the shipping lines are so protective of the information on the prices, on the transit time, on of the new uh, developments that they are uh, creating because the market is so very competitive. And also we have to remember that blockchain is not a universal solution for everything. If you Google some of the uh, recent articles by uh, Bloomsburg, by New York Times, etc., you will see that there are more and more ideas on centralized database systems that don't really need to be changed. There are systems that work better without blockchain, and there are systems that will benefit hugely from it. So once again, I believe that we will see uh, case studies. And my take on this is that there is a perfect uh, condition for coexisting of both, because not all data can be disclosed in the end. Yeah, um, I think uh, blockchain is an umbrella term. Um, it's not something that was very recent. It's actually an um, am amalgamation of technologies. So I think uh, when Bang implements blockchain, it's not like he had, they have to abandon the legacy technology, but rather they have to open up. So Deutsche Bank might need to open up their data to standard charted. So I think that is more like a business decision and a political decision, uh, much less a technological question. So I think um, it will be able to coexist uh, depending on the level of uh, implementation. Yeah. Thank you. We have, we have a question. We've got three minutes and a bit. No, please, go ahead. Just we got time for a quick question before Just, wrapping up. Just uh, a quick question. You were talking about the fluctuation of the currencies and how that would affect, for instance, the blockchain and smart contracts because, of course, they use gas for mm -hmm. each transaction. Yeah. Um, could you just see how that would affect, uh, for instance, implementing this uh, technology for, for a cargo system or, of course, this, I guess you sort of balance what is benefiting moving the grading or the traditional way based on the gas that you might consume per transaction? If you, if, if you don't mind me just to have a better understanding, the question is more about implementing of uh, smart contracts or the currency fluctuation. It involves a bit of both. <laughs> both. Perfect. We live in an integrated world. Very well. Okay. You want to start? Jack, yeah, go ahead. Um, there's this thing called stable coin. So, uh, for example, in markets, say, um, the, um, the example just now, Venezuela. So, um, the use case is probably like this. Uh, a Venezuelan would change uh, his or her Bolivares into a uh, Bitcoin uh, or a, a stable coin. So for example, uh, USDT, okay? And then uh, store its value. So it's, it's being packed into the US dollar or the Bitcoin. So, so I think there are, there are ways and means to, to achieve that um, or at least hedge against uh, the volatility. From the shipping side, I think we would be more talking about the smart contracts implementation rather than the currency, because there is uh, enough uh, challenges with the payment system in shipping as it is with the general currencies not implementing Bitcoin yet. But for the smart contracts, definitely there is a huge future. We see a lot of comp uh, companies starting to implement it already, especially since uh, shipping has to deal with different time zones and automatically executive uh, contracts is the best solution so that the cargo can move fast and you don't have to pay any detention. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we got at the end of the session. So if we have now to look at the crystal ball, we got a technology that has been around for 10 years, is not yet mainstream. Four years from now, is it going to get there? How is it going to change business and shape industries? Is it going to be a logistic game, a medical payment game, a document management, an ID, uh, a retail payment, financial inclusion play. What is it going to happen? If we are investors, where would we put our chip? Thank you. So um, I would definitely imagine that uh, logistics and international trade would be affected on a huge scale because this is some of the basics of globalization and connecting the world with products and services. But if I were to invest my own money, I'm not sure if I would actually put it into logistics service at this very <laughs> point. I think that in the end, as Zach mentioned and uh -huh. we all agreed, uh, we have to see the case studies and the companies and situations and ecosystems where it already works and where it is already profitable. Just to give an example, 
For instance, um, there is a company that's called uh, in NVIDIA, mm -hmm. and uh, this company works with uh, graphics process units. Uh, this technology can be used for gaming, it can be used for uh, artificial intelligence, for many different things. But knowing that this company is actually one of the leaders in its sector, and knowing that this technology of the GPUs actually can be used and applied for currency, for cryptocurrency mining, I would imagine that this would be a safe bet. I can put my money into a company that is leading the sector and whose solutions are promoting the Bitcoin, the uh, blockchain technology, and would probably expect more revenue on that side. Thank you, Zach. Is that an investment advice? Really? <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I think, uh, I, I still think strongly that it's, it's banking and fintech because um, the brother of blockchain is cryptocurrency. Um, cryptocurrency is like the tainted brother of, of blockchain. Uh, but I think these two are like, you know, you cannot separate them. It's, it's like a twin uh, sister or twin brother. So I think um, uh, cryptocurrency uh, and blockchain would definitely uh, impact banking and finance. So I think that, that is the, the, um, the big thing uh, that will happen. So I think if I were to put my money in, I would put it in uh, the finance or uh, banking industry. Yeah, I think that will be uh, disrupted. Thank yeah. you. Now, 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 we are not in investors, advisors, so <laughs> yeah. not don't, 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 ki don't consider us liable for potential losses <laughs> in case of investment decision made on anything discussed on this panel. With this, I would like you to join me in thanking the two panel speakers, Zach and Aliona. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I leave you in the very good hands of, uh, of Jeffrey. Thanks again for Thank your you. attention.